It's time for the double stop with Brian Sword. Welcome to the double stop. I'm Brian Sword. This week on the show, I've got something a little different. Producer Ian Little. He's most known for his work with Duran Duran in the 80s. He did the single, Is There Something I Should Know, and the album Seven and the Ragged Tiger. Both of those considered classics now by Duran Duran fans. Ian was very kind to talk to me when he had a cold, so you will hear a little bit of sniffling, but he did soldier on and get through it, which was really great, because I think a lot of people probably would have cancelled uh, feeling under the weather, but not him, he soldiered through, which is great. He also is one of those guests that I absolutely love because he goes into great detail on everything. He remembers everything. So he gave me a three hour interview. So this first half, which is an hour and a half, takes us throughout his early career and how he got his how he got a start. And it takes us up to and including the recording of Duran Duran's single, If There's Something I Should Know, which is quite a story, the recording of that. The next episode, will be Seven and the Ragged Tiger and everything that happened after that album. So look for that in the near future. We'll also talk about a music outreach program that he started on, but that's in the next episode as well. So for now, let's get right to it. As a lifelong Duran Duran fan, this is something I'm really excited about. So here is my interview with Ian Little. Well, first of all, you need to know that I'm adopted. So I was adopted as a six-month-old baby. Uh, My mum basically went to a children's home and was presented with a row of of cots with babies in them. And she walked along and she picked me out. And that's the best thing that could have happened to me because she was a wonderful mother and father. Um, Unfortunately, my dad died when I was 11. But I was the first person in my family to go to university. So uh, my dad had been in the Royal Navy, you know, the equivalent to your Navy out there. Um, I don't know what it's called. And I've got a stepbrother who's nine years older than me that, that was a naturally born child. My mother had him, uh, but she was a Christian woman and she just felt that it was the right thing to do, that when they could afford to have a second child, she felt it was the right thing to do to adopt a child rather than have one of her own again, which she could have done. So, you know, there's a, there's some sort of morality there. There's some thinking there that, that made her decide to adopt a baby rather than have another one of her own. Um, the only thing that, that, I mean, the only, there's no downside to it at all, but, that, that, but I was very different to the rest of the family. And, um, you know, I decided to go to art school and did my BA in fine art painting. Uh, nobody else in the family had any knowledge of painting or or the art or music for that matter. But, you know, I didn't grow up in a house where I was music playing all the time or anything like that. My my dad died when I was eleven, uh, which was very sad. I'd only just got to know him, and he was a, a you know a really nice guy. He had a a small car which he got from his company job, and he used to drive it faster than my mother liked. And I can remember sitting in the back and just jumping with glee as my mum would say, "Oh, it's too fast, Harry! It's too fast!" And he would just carry on driving fast and say, "Oh, shut up!" You know. And I loved it. So happy memories. But um, yeah, I'm I'm talking too much. You must tell me when to stop. I'm just, you know, I'm going beyond answering your question anyway. Oh, that's great. That's what the show is all about. Okay. Now, the music side, was that, even though it wasn't a musical family, was that something that was always there for you? Or did you really find your love of music later on? I found it later on, and I tell you exactly what happened. 
I was into the fine arts and I was at college and um, I fell totally in love with a girl that was on my course. Uh, she was in my year and I saw her every day and she had a boyfriend already who was a very handsome and quite well equipped uh, Polish guy who was in the fashion department. So, you know, the chances of me sort of pulling her away from this Polish guy were very, very remote. But despite that, You'll, you'll understand what this has to do with music in a minute. But I came back to college at the start of the summer term, and she wasn't there. And I asked around the place and asked where she was and found out that she was doing the whole term in a college in France, that she'd done an exchange program with a student in France and that there was a French student working in, in our class and she'd gone to France. So I just honestly, it's mad really but I just packed my bag and went. Wow. And went to this college in France and I, I approached the principal, the head of the college and of course being French he thought it was wonderful the, the passion and the, the, the you know the, the fact that I was so so much in love and all the passion had led me to to coming there and he he just rang up the college in London and said yes it's perfectly all right we've got a place for him we'll find somewhere for him to live it's fantastic and he sorted the whole thing out amazing and yeah it is amazing and, and so eventually I mean the long and short of it is that my persistence paid off that in the end the, the girl Debbie um, decided that although I wasn't uh, a match for this Polish guy in terms of ma of looks or of sort of material um, wealth if you like that spiritually I was his superior and, and that's that's the honest truth. And so she she decided to to put a lot in with me, and she was the one that first introduced me to uh, some music by a band called Roxy Music, which of course mm -hmm. you know. Of course. And I was became obsessed with them. I thought they were marvelous, and everything they did, I owned. And I include all the solo projects by individual members. I had the lot and knew them inside out. And it really became um, an obsession with me to, to, to like and to get into Roxy music. And when I was at art college in that second term, you know, when we came back and we started the final year, in fact, I decided that I wasn't really any good. <laughs> I, you know, I looked around at the other students and the work they were producing, and I looked at the work that I was producing and just thought, I, I'm rubbish. I'm just not good enough. to. Be, you know, the, the, the people around me are doing work that's far superior, and that it's pointless. And, and I, I completed the course in order to get the BA. But as soon as I left, I didn't uh, look for a, a career in fine art. I decided that um, one of the things, one of the things about Roxy that I really liked and was very saddened by his departure was Brian Eno. And as you know, if you know Roxy music, he only played in the first three albums and then he left. It was a question of two big egos in the band, one Brian Ferry and one Brian Eno, and they were both big egos and very strong in terms of the direction they felt that they wanted to go in. And it was inevitable that there was going to be a breakup. Um, and, and it was either Brian left or, or, you know, Brian Ferry left or Brian Eno left. And it wasn't going to be Brian Ferry because... He was the front man and he'd founded the band and he uh, had that sort of, sort of position of strength. And so Brian Eno walked away from the band. 
And uh, what I discovered after that, Brian started to make solo albums. And I don't know if you know Here Come the Warm Jets. Do you know that album? Uh, not really, no. Okay, well, it was the first solo album that Brian Eno released. And I played it and I was just blown away. Every single track was, to me, brilliant. And I just played it over and over and over again. I just couldn't get enough. It just had a character with totally unique. I'd never heard anything like it before in all my life. Because the the reason was Brian Ferret but Brian Eno is not a musician. Okay? He came from art college just like I did. And when he was interviewed one time and the interviewer said, What instrument is your main sort of stay, if you like? And he said, The studio is my instrument. And that did it. That was all it took for me to realize I could have a career in music. As soon as I heard that, and having known the music that he'd produced and having loved it, you know, because he did all this ambient stuff and, and, you know, he had two or three separate labels. He put out ambient albums. His first one was called Music for Airport. Um, you know, it just was done very much like a piece of art. He created music like you would paint a painting. He seemed to regard the music as as a canvas, a three-dimensional canvas. You had left, right, up and down, forward and back. And you've got a cube. And you can place things within that cube very precisely you know you can sort of turn it a bit to the left and put a bit of reverb on it and it'll push it back put more reverb on it and it'll push it back further take the reverb up off and it comes right up to the front again so you've got that ability to move things within that cube and if you listen carefully enough, which you have to do if you're producing good music, you can make sure that everything has got its own space within that musical cue. And uh, that's what I took the inspiration from, from Brian. And um, yeah, that's how I got started. That's really interesting. I've never heard it put that way, but that makes a ton of sense. I hope so. It's it's different. Okay, so what steps did you take then? Clearly, you're not afraid to do whatever it takes to get what you want. So what steps did you take at that point when you decided you were going to pursue music? Well, serendipity is probably the most important thing in my life in terms of my career. I went around the world with Debbie, the girl from art college, we went to India and we travelled through India and into Nepal and then through um, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore and flew to Perth and this took about 18 months and when we got to Perth we had $50 and so the idea was we'd been given six months working visas but they were on the basis that we had £150 for every month we were going to stay there. So we were so scared that they were going to check how much money we had. <laughs> and of course they didn't, because if they had, they wouldn't have let us in. But they didn't, and they let us in, and we very quickly got jobs. Um, and we were going to go back to India. We'd met a German couple who were buying... Tibetan jewellery in Nepal and taking it to Germany and selling it for a massive markup, something like three times the price. I mean, if you bought proper antique opal and silver Tibetan jewellery and took it to a Western country, you could make a lot of money. I mean, it was beautiful, beautiful stuff. And, and um, 
<clears throat> in the in the West in some posh jewelry shop, it suddenly you know it had that value and and there was no arguing about it and so that's what we were going to do. But then I got a letter from my best friend saying that his marriage was breaking up. And uh, he felt that the only person that could talk to his wife and, and get her to change her mind was me. I'd been best man at the wedding. And like an idiot, I suppose, I threw all my plans out the window and, and went to England to to resolve this problem. Um, in hindsight, it wasn't a clever thing to do. Three months after I arrived, Debbie had gone off with this bloke and kicked me out of the flat and I was on my own and homeless. Um, we were living in a flat, I was all to explain, we were living in a flat that Debbie's father owned. He owned a chain of dry cleaning shops and above one of them was a two-floor flat and he gave us that for nothing to live in and that's where I lived. And of course, when Debbie... I went away for a week to do some work, uh, theatre work in Bristol, which is in the west of England. And when I came back, there was just a note on the table saying, I've gone to live with Dave. You've got a week to get out of the flat. And that was it. It was pretty pretty harsh. Yeah, no kidding. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I, the reason I tell you this is only because um, when I was living with Debbie and in that flat, I guess I was not really doing anything because I didn't have to. I was just, you know, getting stoned. I liked smoking ash. I was just getting stoned and listening to music and not really doing anything. And, of course, when she kicked me out and my romance uh, fell apart, I was very upset at first. It took me a long, long time to get over it. But at the same time, it, it triggered me into doing something with my life. Now, I'd known a couple of young architects when I was at uh, art college doing my BA, and they were doing a seven-year course to become qualified RIBA architects, a seven-year course. And one of them, they were, one of them was from a wealthy family, so was his his wife, and they'd married and bought their own terraced house that was quite near the college, but they needed to rent one of the bedrooms out to help pay for the mortgage. And I became friends with him. Um, I found I'm terrible. I found out quite early on <clears throat> the way to get on is to get people to like you. And it sounds terribly kind of um, Machiavellian or something. I don't know. But I, I did it. I sort of went into this house and he converted it himself. And I just started saying, wow, look at that. That's amazing. And, you know, I really like that low um, shelf that you've put all the way around. And the stairs going up in the middle and the long kitchen. It's brilliant. You know? And, of course, I, I, I just created a rapport with him and created empathy with him where he decided the following day, you know, having spoken to his wife, that in fact, I was the person they should rent the room out to. And so I got in uh, with them and got myself a nice room and got to know him and about the world of architecture. Now, when they... I went off and wandered about and did what I did, but that they left college and at a very young age, considering you know, the normal practice is that you leave college as a qualified architect and you work for a, a known practice for several years. And then if you're lucky enough, you've built up a reputation and you start your own business. But these two guys, Paul, that I stayed with, and another guy called Alan, decided straight away that they were going to set up. And part of the reason was Paul knew some very wealthy people, and he got work 
changing and refurbishing very big apartments in London's more expensive areas where if someone bought a flat or apartment and wanted it changed, then that involved getting an architect because of the scale of works. You know, it wasn't just changing the colours and moving things around. It involved architectural work, you know, structural right. changes. Mm-hmm. You understand what I mean? Oh, yeah. And so I started working for Paul doing visualizations of what the, the apartment would look like once the changes had been implemented. And I would, you know, do different colorways and different sort of uh, layouts, but basically just do renditions of what the thing was going to look like. And that became part of the presentation that, that the architects would give to the prospective client. And I was working with them quite happily. And one day, Paul got a phone call from California from a guy called Gus. And I can't remember his surname, but I know his name was Gus. And this is all in the book, by the way. So you're getting a sort of preamble, whatever you call it, preview of the, of the sum of the book, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> um Gus said that Supertramp, now do you remember them? Oh yeah, absolutely. Right, well Supertramp were about to embark on a world tour for Breakfast in America. Now they'd had several albums that had done well in the charts, in America especially, but they weren't cash rich. They'd sort of bought houses and they'd got various little toys and whatever, but cash-wise, they weren't really very well off. They weren't as rich as people would think they were, you know, having had two or three hit albums. But A&M knew that Breakfast in America was going to change all that, that it was going to be absolutely massive, and um, thus it proved. But they wanted a stage set design, and they put put a, what's the word, a tender out, to all the companies that do that sort of thing and to our amazement they chose our design and we'd never done this before and there were companies that were absolute experts and boy were they were their noses put out i mean they they really couldn't understand that these kind of you know newcomers had come and it wasn't to do with gus it was made the decision was made by the members of the band and it was purely on the merits of the design. And we, we, we came up with a design that was based on hexagons. And you broke the hexagon down into triangles. Sorry, I meant diamonds, not triangles, diamond shapes. And so if you, if you imagine, if you take a, a set of three and make a, uh, a, 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 a you know, an hexagon out of them, if you paint one white, one mid-gray and one black, it looks three-dimensional. So we created a stage set based on that, and we had two or three levels as well. So the drum was at, was at the highest level at the back, and then it came down one for, like, the sax and the bass or whatever, and then it came down again for the lead singer. And, and, and we, we made a lighting rig that was not... It didn't have different depths, would it? But it was made of hexagonal units that could be uh, connected together in different shapes. Um, and the the thing about it was that the tour was going to be going to different types of venues that that were radically different. For example, on the one hand, it could be playing in a football stadium. And the lighting rig would have to be on legs that we would have to make and, and, and create it securely. And then in other venues, obviously they had hanging points and, and the lighting truss could be hung from the ceiling. So we had to cope with those different variants and there were others. It was decided by the band that someone from the architects ought to go out there before the tour started and make sure that the 
every, all the rig was was working. You know, it had to be dismantled and put into a series of semi trucks and then taken out again and built. And obviously, that was a process that needed to run relatively smoothly. So they wanted to know that this stage set could be dismantled quite easily and that two guys could carry each unit and it could be stacked in the truck and, and, and not take up that much room or too much room and the, the lighting rig was the same. Now, the two senior partners were far too busy in the office in London and so the job fell to poor old me and I had to fly out to, to LA. It's you know, dirty work with someone's got to do it. <laughs> and that that was my first trip to America. I was very young, um, 23, maybe 22, I don't know. And I flew to LA. Um, the funny story that's in the book uh, was that I was walking along the street thinking that I could get a bus from the centre of LA, I was near Hollywood, I was near the Sunset Strip, walking towards Santa Monica, and thinking I could get a bus to Topanga Canyon, which, if you know LA, you'll realise is, is a pretty absurd idea. Um, and I was walking along the street, and I saw two guys standing on the steps of a building, which was a church, and so I went up to them. As I, as I got close enough, I said, oh, excuse me, can you... Hang on, you're Bob Dylan. And he, he turned <laughs> around and said, yeah, sure, man, take it easy. And it was Bob Dylan. I couldn't believe it. I just was oh, standing there. And my mouth just was <laughs> open. And he just sort of said, well, what is it? You know, what what's the problem? And I, uh, you know, I didn't go into the details in the book, but I just said that's what happened. But he basically advised me that getting a bus to Topanga Canyon was not really an option. And where was I going? And I told him that I was staying with the sax player from Supertramp, John Helliwell. And he knew his phone number. And oh, my goodness. It, which was ridiculous. and he, But he did. And he went to a phone and... Uh, called him and told him that I was here in, in, you know, this road near Santa Monica and and basically could he come and pick me up? And he did. (laughs) So Unreal. (laughs) uh, Yeah, it was. It was totally surreal. I mean, that's the the word. It just was surreal to, you know, have a conversation. Just it burnt into my memory. I'll never forget it. The, the look on his face and the, the the expression on mine would have been priceless. But you know, it's just completely gobsmacked. I, I, just the, <laughs> you know, my legs went jelly. I just didn't know what to do. As I'm as Bob Dylan, I'm standing in front of Bob Dylan for fuck's sake. What you know? What am I meant to do? It's like incredible. Shall I bow down or what? You know, this is like one of the biggest icons of the 20th century. It doesn't matter whether you like his music or listen to it. He is an icon of the 20th century. Absolutely. Now, how was John as a host? John was a great host. Um, and he took me to the Supertramp headquarters, which was a studio lot. And they were, you know, they occupied a huge stage set where my design was set up and they were going through the set list of songs that they were going to do for the show. And, of course, my job was to oversee, although they didn't really need me, but just to oversee the riggers dismantling the stage set and putting it in the in the trucks and then building it in a different configuration and getting the legs out and making sure they were right and getting the lighting rigged together. And, you know, I could hear them cursing at some points and (laughs) I think they found it quite complicated, but it worked. So that was my first taste in the music industry. And then John said to me, uh, I was just about to go home, and John said to me, 
why don't you come on the first six gigs? And I thought, my God, how, you know, this is just ridiculous because, you know, to go on the first six gigs of a band like Supertramp, you know, they, they, they were the biggest band in the US that year. You know the logical song and, and whatever else. So they were. It was a num. It was at the top of the Billboard charts for six weeks. You know, it was just massive. So I rang up the architects in London and said, "Look, you know, I've decided, or we've decided, the band have decided that I ought to make sure that the system runs smoothly. You know, in the battlefield, like you know, actually working." on uh, live sets. I don't know why I was calling it the battlefield, but do you know what I mean? Uh, working in action. And this was my story. And I said, yeah, yeah, that sounds a good idea, Ian. Good thinking, you know. So uh, off I went. <laughs> and honestly, I wrote this in the book. The first gig was in Fresno, California, which I don't know if you know it or not, but it's a small town, but it's got a big auditorium and we played there and for the first time in my life I was given an access all areas pass and I tell you if you've ever had one of those they are power you can just flash them under the nose of these goons that are standing guarding the and they just have to let you through and I used it to its maximum. I went behind the stage, at the side of the stage, at the front of the audience, in the audience, at the mixing desk in house. I went everywhere and used the thing to its maximum. I just couldn't believe the power it had to, to you know, to generate uh, access to all areas. It was brilliant. Loved it. So that that sort of taste of music was planted a seed is, is how I put it in the book. John was great and John didn't say anything about, you know, you could have a career or anything like that. He just said, well, music seems to be pretty much in your blood and whatever. And after six weeks, I got on a plane and flew back to London. But all the time I was thinking about music. And I went back to work with the architects and, uh, yeah, then the next chapter starts. So how did you then transition from working on, you know, stage equipment to, to getting into the studio itself? Right. Well, this is another piece that this is the big piece of serendipity. I've already told you that I was a massive Roxy Music fan and, and knew all of their albums and their solo member albums. Paul went to a wedding one day, one weekend. It's a sort of quite a posh society where and I, I wedding, I didn't go. And um, Paul had been at a private school uh, called East, at East Dulwich. And one of his Co, one of his colleagues, school college, was a guy called Phil Target Adams. Which, if you sorry, sorry about this, I'm just all bunged up. I don't know why. Um, if you know your Roxy music history, you'll know that Phil Target Adams is Phil Manzanera. It was the name of his mother his mother's maiden name because he's part Colombian or something of South American. I think it's South the Colombian. It might be Peru. I'm not sure. But anyway, he met Phil at this wedding and Phil said to him, listen, I bought this beautiful Art Deco house in Surrey and it's got 14 acres of land and it has an 18th century coach house in the ground. And I've decided that it's a listed building, so I've decided to renovate the exterior to its former glory, and then inside that, build a studio. 
so it's like a building within a building because obviously the studio has to be soundproofed and all the rest of it, but the outside has to look like an 18th century coach house. And he said the architects that have been doing the job don't seem to be quite on it because the place has had scaffolding around it for six months and nothing's happened. And he asked Paul whether we would, whether he would go down and cast his eye over the project. So he asked me to accompany him and we went down and it was a mess. There was no roof on the building so the interior was a, a tip, just a complete rubbish tip. And the, the state, the scaffolding, in, let alone the building it was supporting, but the scaffolding was terrible. And it was costing Phil a lot of money. I mean, I don't know the figure, but I should think it was something approaching a thousand pound a week to rent scaffolding of that scale, you know, to, to completely surround the coach house. And so the RI, do you know the RIBA? It's the Royal Institute of British Architects and they're quite a strict organisation and so in order to get one architect taken off of a project and for you to then replace him as it were to take on the contract you've got to make a strong case and so Phil and I immediately got to work and, and listed a load of things that were wrong um, in how this guy, this practice had gone about the job. We asked them for plans they gave us which were appalling you know, terrible use of space and um, just the whole thing was a mess there was no way that, that he could make a case to defend himself and so we went to the RIBA and they considered, I don't know what they do, if they have a hearing or what they do, but they came down in our favour, um, booted this guy's practice off and then Phil was able to appoint Paul's practice um, as the designers, Paul and David. It's called David and Bain. I don't know... Um, Paul Davis was, was obviously the one that I was really friendly with and David Bain was the other partner and the two of them had known each other at Art College so that's the, the, the picture they were called Davis and Bain so we got the contact to design the studio and we went at it with great passion and we used the space wonderfully I mean one of the things that's unique about the studio is that the live room has at the end two massive gothic windows now if you've been in any studios you will know that having natural light anywhere is quite rare um, because a lot of studios are in industrial places or they're in town you know industrial they're in commercial blocks or whatever and so everything has to be double soundproofed and all the walls have to be triple thick and stuff like that so because this was in Phil's grounds and these glass windows were there we left them and it meant that even from the control room which had an incredible window to isolate it from the control room, uh, the live room. Um, we had a, I don't know if you've seen the windows they make, but they're triple glazed. You've got one pane of glass in front that you look at that's level. Then in between that and the second pane of glass that's level is a pane of glass that's at an angle that runs from top to bottom. Can you picture that? Yeah, right. Yeah. And that is, and of course, round the side is a neoprene rubber seal um, and some sort of other exotic materials to make sure that that window was A, you know, silent and B, didn't transmit vibrations. And that's why you had this one at an angle in the middle. 
because it stopped any vibrations transmitting from one pane of glass to the other. Um, very clever, very expensive. <laughs> but um, but it meant that, that, that from the control room, you could see light through these, you know, if you were there during the day, you could look through into the live room and out through the end, you could see natural light, which again, was just unheard of. And Phil wanted a large control room where he could play on his own because he liked to fiddle around on his own and, and didn't want to have a band involved. And so we made a control room that was on two levels. So you had like a lower level, which had the desk and the engineer would set, sit. And then you had two steps where an artist could sit quite comfortably with their instrument and fiddle about behind the engineer with the desk close at hand. So, you know, if he wanted to change something, he could reach over or he could ask the engineer to do it. And then behind that was a big area that you could set up synths for, you know, and other instruments so that you could really put a whole band in there apart from a drum kit which you'd want to record in the live room anyway. So what I said was when it was finished, this is the serendipity. When it was finished, I stood in the control room and I looked at this equipment and I looked at these big JBL monitors in the wall up, you know, up in the ceiling or whatever. And I just thought, this is where I want to be. <laughs> I just felt this is this is home, you know. I really did. I felt a warm glow in me, and so I asked Paul, the architect, whether I could have a few minutes to talk to Phil to get some advice on how I could get into the music business. But I had ulterior motives, and when Phil came. I immediately started to pour out all the information I knew about his albums and Roxy's albums. I said, how'd you get that sound? You know on that track, there's that bit, and there's the, some sound. It sounds to me like a synth and a guitar, but I'm not sure. Is that what you did? And, you know, at the end of that track, it's sort of... And I just went through everything, everything that I heard in those tracks and to be honest with you Phil sat there and listened to me for three hours three fucking hours I could not believe it and at the end of it he just said well and he said uh, you're hearing things that most members of the public don't and uh, I think you could have the potential of having a career in this industry if you wanted so uh, let me think about it and uh, I'll get back to you and that was it and I left and I felt pretty enthusiastic I mean obviously I didn't know what he was thinking or what he was going to suggest or whatever but I went back to the architects feeling pumped up excited and I didn't know what was going to happen but I felt something was so one of the things that happened was when we built the studio, it had what was at the time a state-of-the-art alarm system and it had motion detection. It's hard to believe now, but the when the motion detector went off, an automated system would dial up on one, do you remember old-fashioned phones that had a circular dial? Oh, of course. Yeah? Yeah. Well, this this had a mechanism where a, a rod would <laughs> honestly go into the right and it would dial oh, the goodness. local police station. It would take about five minutes, but it would do it in the end. And so what Phil had to do was run across from the house with his two Alsatian dogs get into the studio, get to the cupboard and take the, the phone off the hook 
before it finished dialing the police because obviously then they would come driving up the hill to the house and for no reason because the thing had been set off by wind. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it was, a, it, and we got the manufacturers to come in and they said, look, if you reduce its sensitivity, um, insurance is going to go up. Simple as that. Um, you know, you've, you've got to have it as like that because it works. You know, if someone comes in, they make a single step and the alarm goes off. Um, or even, you know, the fact of them opening the window would set the alarm off, whatever. So if you reduce the sensitivity, it won't pick up things like that and it will be as good as useless. And as I say, the insurance would go up. So it had to stay as it was. And Phil came to me because I'd come down to, to check out, you know, what was happening with the alarm. And he came up to me and said, I've got a proposition for you. He said, I'm going away on tour for three months. My wife's going to be here on her own. And I don't want her to have to deal with turning the alarm off in the middle of the night. So the studio had been designed with a small office, a kitchen and a shower room. So it was like, you know, a functional flat with a studio in it and he said if you're prepared to come and live here for three months if by the time I get back you figured out how everything works and what this is all about we'll talk about you getting a job here as the gopher you know the, the sandwich maker and tea maker and whatever and I thought, this is an opportunity I can't turn down. You know, the people that were going to work in that studio, it was a state-of-the-art 24-track facility. You know, it wasn't a demo studio or some rubbish that normally is what you have to do is to start off is to get a assistance job in some little demo studio where you're going to work on stuff that's never going to be released and all the rest of it. So I agreed. And um, when he left, I looked at all this equipment and I looked at the desk and I couldn't make head and tail of it. I mean, it just was like it came out of the Starship Enterprise. It just was a completely alien thing to me, honestly, uh, Brian. I, I couldn't, I couldn't get my head around how it worked at all. I didn't, you know, the thing about a mixing desk, recording mixing desk, is that in fact it's a lot of channels that are duplicated. They're all the same. There's just a lot of them. But you don't get that at first. You don't sort of realize that's what it is, that they're all the same. And it's just, a, you know what I mean? And there's a patch bay and you don't recognize that that's quite a simple way of just connecting one thing to another. And, uh, you know, you've got a lot of outboard equipment and that's all, wired into the patch base so that you can, you know, say you've got a, an even tied harmonizer and you want to plug it into one channel or like, say like a guitar or something, you can do that with the patch bay. It's easy. It just, you know, you've got all the channels and then all the um, effects and everything are all on the patch bay. It, it's, it's actually quite a simple uh, machine, if you like. But to me, it was a mystery. So what I used to do, I was really sneaky in those days. I used to ring up the people that manufactured the equipment, the, mainly the desk, which was a Trident desk, I think. And I'd ring them up and say, listen, there's something wrong with this desk. There's nothing coming out. There's no sound coming out. So some guy would turn up, you know, with his box and his, all his equipment, you know, some expert. And he'd look at the desk and he'd look at me and he'd look at the desk and he'd push one button and everything would work. <laughs> and I'd say, oh, right. <laughs> 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 oh, my God. And he just thought, you cheeky fucker, you know, you're, excuse my language, but you're, you're just taking the mickey here, mate. 
And I said, oh, I, you know, I just didn't realise that it was it was straightforward as that. You know, you, that button just uh, basically I hadn't turned it on. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's why it wasn't working. I hadn't turned the bloody thing on, and of course, once I did, there was sound coming out. But of course, I still didn't understand how things were were working and. Over the preceding weeks, I became friendly with that guy and I used to ring him up and say, look, I don't understand how. And by then he realized that I didn't know that I was learning. And so he would come over when he could manage it. You know, I'd say, look, there's no panic. You know, just whenever you've got some free time. And he was really nice and he'd come over and he'd show me things and teach me things. And I got to the point where I could, put together something on the tape. Phil had given me a load of um, rubbish tape, you know, that I could record over. And I started to put things together on. I, you realised you've got 24 tracks and you could build up on top of it. So if you could play one sound that wasn't in itself complete but was a sound... Then on the next track, you can play the next part. So, for example, with a guitar chord that had three strings, three notes, I could put one on each track. And so you'd have three tracks and it would make a chord. <laughs> you think about it. It's a pretty basic way of putting music together. But I used... Uh, that Phil had an old-fashioned Roland... I think it was called a combi, a rhythm cube or a combi cube. Do you remember those? Oh, jeez, I don't remember those now. Well, I, I can't fully remember the name of them, but they were square and had a wooden case and just a, a, a very limited set of rhythms, you know, like a boss and over, a book, da da book, da book, da da book, da da and things like that. It's just really basic. And uh, I proceeded to, to put rhythms down on tape and then use echoes and delays and feedback. And I make these incredibly complicated patch bay systems where I'd, I'd send the harmonizer to the delay and the delay back to... Um, a phaser and you know phaser back to the harmonizer and all the things like that so and what i loved was the feedback you could get if you turn the volume up enough they'd all start feeding back on each other and you'd get these incredible wood sounds coming out you know these sort of whooshes and basically wrong sounds <laughs> i loved them and I used to record them. And, and what I did was I put a drum beat down and then I played a bit of guitar but by in my own unique way, not being a t guitarist, and put a bass line down by banging on a... Phil had a, an old Moog foot pedal. You know, like an organ has foot mm -hmm. pedals. Yeah an old-fashioned organ. Well, Phil had a, one of those, but it was a Moog, so it was a synth. But I used to be able to hit them with my fist, these different wooden blocks, and I'd bang them and sort of, by doing so, make a bass line, which is very basic, but <clears throat> was a bass line. <laughs> and I did that. And then I, I realized that it lacked, a focus that this track lacked a focus and I thought I know what it is I've got to put a, some sort of vocal on it well I can't sing at all but I listened to a few things of Eno's where uh, I listened to the Bush of Ghosts album do you know that album My Life in the Bush of Ghosts right yeah I haven't heard it in a long time but yeah I know it yeah well, well they, they used excerpts from AM radio oh okay right and I I had, um, I think it, I don't know, I think it must have been pre that or I heard something like it before, but samplers weren't around yet. And 
I had a cassette with a guy giving a talk. His name was Bubba Freejohn, and he was a self-proclaimed American guru. And he did a talk called The Central Proposition, and it was about how death was not the great negation of life. That was the central theme. And so I recorded excerpts from this tape onto a half inch and then I'd start the 24 track and start the the half inch and try and get them to sync so I could put these phrases onto the 24 track in the right position and it took me hours literally hours to get it to the point where I was happy with it where they came in at, at, at some sort of sensible place and I just put a few little things and I'd put delay on the end of them and so they, you know, would make them more in time by having that delay at the end. And It was a, a very strange record. It's caught, If you want to hear it, if you Google the central proposition, um... I'll tell you my name in a minute. You, you'll listen to it. But um, I was up all night finishing it. And in the morning, I got on the train and I went to London. And I went to Beggar's Banquet, which was a, an independent label. I think they put um, Gary Newman out, which was their big hit. And uh, they they got a couple of offshoots. One was called 4AD which was doing really well. And then a new one called Situation 2, which was run by a guy called Peter Ken. And he listened to my single and said, yeah, I'll put that out. That's great. <laughs> I couldn't believe wow. it. <laughs> <laughs> and so he said, I'm going to send you to a graphic designer because I think you should have a picture, Steve. I thought, what? I said, right, oh, yeah, okay, no problem. So I went to see this graphic designer and we came up with an idea and it was going to be an orange cover with two sort of vertical lines that were squiggles and then in the top right corner was a square black and white illustration of a Chinese advert for Coca-Cola. And it was a very strange picture, but you could tell what it was. But it was sort of deliberately had been fuzzed up, so it was a bit strange. And that became the cover, and on the back it had the details. And while I was in the in the office of Beggar's Banquet, Peter said, what are you going to call yourself? And I said, I don't know, possibly an Arab. He said, what? And I said, possibly in Arab. He said, no, that's too long. I, he said, where does that come from? And I said, well, because I'm adopted, I didn't used to look British. I, I had sort of black curly hair and quite a dark, swarthy complexion. So when people used to ask where I was from, I used to say, I don't know, possibly an Arab. And because of that, I thought, well, that's what I call myself, but it's possibly an Arab. And he said, no, it's too much of a mouthful, you know. <laughs> so I was looking across the road out of this first floor window and I saw an Indian restaurant and it was called New Asia. And I said, oh, New Asia. That's what I call myself, New Asia. And this was just before John Wetton produced that super group called Asia. Do you remember them? Oh, yeah, of course. Well, this was preempting that. It was ah, New Asia. Yeah, I went before them. I got <laughs> <laughs> so this single came out and, and the, the, didn't do anything. They sent me to New York for a week to be interviewed on college radio. And Melody Maker did a four-page article on it with a photograph of me. And they reviewed it, and the guy said it was the best album of the year, but none of that helped it sell. I mean, I don't think it recouped its money. Not that it cost very much. But what happened was Phil came back at the end of three months, and he, <laughs> he, he had a habit of coming over to the studio without and forget his keys, and so he'd have to knock on the door. 
So he knocked on the door and I opened it and just thrust this seven inch single at him. And he sort of took it and said, well, what's this? I said, that's my first single. And he was just <laughs> over the, you know, <laughs> you, oh, you can imagine. Amazing. Yeah. So he let you stay. Huh? So he let you stay. Did he give you the job, the gopher job? Yeah. Yeah. He said, well, um, blimey, I can't, um, he was speechless for a bit. And then he said, well, obviously I've got to give you the job. I mean, you, you just, not only have you understood the equipment, but you've gone on, how on earth you've done it is beyond me. And um, so if you Google um, the central proposition by New Asia, you will actually find some guy has done an animation for it, which is incredible. I mean, he must have spent a long time doing it. And he, you must think that the single is worth listening to. It's so terrible, I think. kind of is <laughs> I have to say wow yeah so how long did you stay at that studio well I stayed there for three years and in that three years I witnessed the creation of Avalon do you know Avalon yeah Roxy Music yeah I think it's a classic I, I, I really do I think a lot of people it's, it's a bit rude but a lot of people say it's their shagging album and they put it on when they're going to have sex. Um, but I just think that it's so well crafted and, and so well put together. And it, it shows 
um, Brian Ferry and Rhett Davis at their best without being too excessive. It borderlines, it's very borderline on being excessive, but it just seems to me to be on the right side of the line. They, you know, Brian was so obsessive about his vocals. It was common practice to, to take two or three tax, tracks of the lead vocal and then take words or phrases from each of that, that was the best and chop it up and make a final composition of, of the three track takes that was the final one, that was the best of the, of the three. Well, Brian used to not just take words. He used to take individual syllables. So if you had a syllable with three, a word with three syllables, he could take the first syllable from one track, the second from another, and the third from another, until he made up a word that he felt was the best expression of that word. And it was borderline obsessive. It really was. But there's no denying that the end result is that he has a, a vocal that that is emotional and draws you in. I mean, it's just it is brilliant. So, and that's on tape. Yeah, to to pull apart words like that on tape. Yeah, like I think that's got to be stress. This is not Pro Tools doing that. No, you no. can do that pretty fast. This is trying to do it on tape. Yeah. That's unreal. Well, we had, what we had to do was we we you, you had a. a two buttons one would mute and one would unmute so you had to hit them two at the identical time you know and, and Rhett used to get me to, to to help him you know and I'd get really good at the, the doing this fast enough in fact I was faster than Rhett and, and used to get the responsibility of doing it but yeah it's really I mean, I also learned, get this, how to edit two-inch tape. So you're, you're cutting a two-inch tape, right? And the way you do it is you manually turn the tape backwards and forwards until you find the, the click of the beginning of a bass drum. So you're looking for the sound of the beater hitting the skin and that first click of the sound it makes, and you move it, the tape backwards and forwards until you find that click, and then you put a china white pencil down the tape. Then you move it on for a bar or however much you want to cut out and find the same thing later on and do the same process and draw the line and then you put the tape on a on a block which is a quarter you know it's a, a 20, 45 degree angle and you put it in the block and you cut it and you cut the other one and then you put them together and put tape across it and play it and hope that it sounds completely you know smooth the, I mean obviously you can't do it where there's a, a symbol decay, uh, you know, there's there's various rules that prevent you making a complete cock up. And the biggest one really is a symbol decay because that obviously, if a symbol decay was just cut off, it would be very noticeable. So you can't do it there. And, and there are other things that, you know, like if there was an echo somewhere that was, you know, or a reverb somewhere that was going on, and you had to watch for things like that. But it, it, if if the situation was right, then it was possible to do that. You did studio work with Roxy Music and and learned a lot. Yeah. How did you go from there to Duran Duran? Then I worked with other people while I was at that in that three years at Gallery, and I learned an awful lot. I worked on an album for Cliff Richard, which is nothing I'm proud of, <laughs> but it was nonetheless a big album. But the person that wrote and produced it was a guy called Alan Tarney. And Alan Tarney was the king of writing middle-of-the-road songs. He wrote We Don't Talk Anymore for, for Cliff Richard. 
it sold five million copies as a single, and it basically re rejuvenated Cliff Richards' career. And Alan wrote it, and he produced it. And after we'd done that album, he booked the studio, or his publisher, ATV, booked the studio for six months, where he would come in every day, and he'd come in at 10 o'clock in the morning, and he'd wander about the studio, either strumming a guitar or, you know, vamping on a keyboard, and by noon, he would have the structure of a song and he would start to record it. And he would record, um, a, I'd program a drum pattern, he'd play a bass line, he'd then put some pads on with a, with a synth, he maybe play a rhythm guitar, and then he'd get to the chorus, and the chorus, he had to work out some lyrics. He said that that was the real hook and that without having lyrics, he couldn't tell whether the chord progression in the chorus was worth anything or not. That was his approach. And so he would try and write lyrics to the chorus, and he would. And so he would sing them, and then he would put a one-part harmony and possibly a two-part harmony he was a multi-instrumentalist and a singer par excellence. I mean, he really was. He was superb. He could play anything. He could sing anything. And it was good enough, far, well, better than good enough. And he would do this. And at the end of the day, at 7 o'clock, 7.30, he would be driving home with a 24-track demo of the song that he'd written that day. And he did that every day for six months, Monday to Friday. And after the first month, so that he'd written 20 songs, I said to him, man, you've written 20 hits. And he turned around to me and said, no, he said, there's two there that I might think about. See if you can pick them out. And I thought, my God, how, you know, ridiculous. But I sat down, I took it on as a challenge, and I, to my credit, I think, I actually picked out two songs, and I told him, and he said, yep, yeah, they're the right ones, which I was amazed at. And the reason I picked them was because they were the ones that, to me, conveyed um, a depth of emotion that the others didn't. The others were flimsy, flippy. I don't know what the word is, but they just seem flimsy. They, they seem one-dimensional, if you like. Whereas these two seem to have a depth to them that if you wrote a good verse, because he used to just la di da the verses, he couldn't be bothered to write the lyrics. But if you wrote good lyrics and you created a story for that chorus, it's got the depth to be able to mean something. And he agreed. And he, you know, went on, as I say, I learned... <clears throat> More and the reason I'm telling this is because I learned more about songwriting and what it takes to write a good song from him than I have from anybody else, either before or, or since. He was an absolute master and he treated it like a job of work, which I don't fully agree with, but it worked for him. And the other thing that he did, which was valuable was he, he said you have to have a scaffolding, you have to have a framework that you put your song into so you know that you're going to have certain parts in certain places to build the thing up and so you know he had this sort of framework he knew he was going to have like a drum machine and then he'd have a pad and then he'd have a bass and then he'd have a guitar lick and you know, all these parts were predetermined in terms of where they fitted. 
No, and, and funnily enough, it didn't end up sounding formulaic, which is what you think it would. It didn't because I don't know that the, the songs developed their own character, but they started off within that structure. So, to answer your question, how did I get to Duran? Um, it's important that you know what I knew and what I didn't know. And as I say, Alan taught me a lot about writing. Phil was on tour in Germany with Roxy Music and Duran were on tour in the same place. And he met a couple of them. I can't remember which pair it was, but he met a couple of the Duranis and, and the Duranis were... You know, they considered Roxy to be one of the bands. You know, they looked up to them and respected them. And they said to Phil that they were going to do their third album, but they wanted to use a new producer because they didn't want to work with Colin Thurston again. He had produced the first two albums and they'd had very little to do or nothing to do with the production. He'd done it done it very well you know they're very musical they're very commercial but they're quite soft and um they wanted something a little bit more hard and rock and rolly and a bit weirder and phil to his credit phil said well you should check out this guy at my studio if you want weird <laughs> yeah, uh, you won't find many people that are weirder than him but he you know he knows how to put a song together so you should check him out so um that was the serendipity that you know the fact that i knew phil so well knew roxy stuff so well that you know and he was confident enough in me to to say to the Durani as well you know you should check this guy out and and you know, you think about it, I was nobody. I'd just worked for three years at his studio. I'd never produced an album of, of any merit at all. I'd done a few indie bands while I was there. and I got a production assistant credit on on Avalon because of the comments I made, but that's all. You know, I used to just make comments about things and Brian thought that, that warranted a production assistant credit, but really I hadn't taken any responsibility for that album, which is what a producer should do. Um, so for him to suggest that I was a candidate was, I don't know, going the extra mile or whatever, but he came back to the studio and he opened the door and he said, oh, by the way, he said, you'll be getting a phone call from Duran Duran's managers in the next few days and of course I said yeah right you know <laughs> nice one you know good joke and um, a few days later the phone rang Michael Barrow or Paul Barrow I can't remember which said we'd like you to uh, remix a track off Rio to see where you're at and uh, we've booked some time at Good Earth which is Tony Visconti's studio in Soho in London and um, that was it so I, I yeah blimey <laughs> <laughs> so the the track you you remixed that was like an audition then it was and do you know what I can't remember what the track was called but it was an instrumental do you know what the track listings on Rio are there's not an instrumental on this album, no. Really? Yeah, you got oh, Rio, My Own you. Way, L Lonely in Your Nightmare, Hungry Like the Wolf, Hold Back the Rain, New Religion, Last Chance on the Stairway, Save Her Prayer, and The Chauffeur. Do you think maybe they gave you a song? They think maybe they give you a song with just no vocals on it then? Maybe. I don't remember dealing with vocals. What I do remember is the bass was in stereo. It had been put through a, a, an effect that made it phased and in stereo. Um, but the story, the important thing to, to understand about this mix is I, I arrived at the studio, the two-inch tape was there, 
And I sat down on the sofa. There was an assistant engineer, and I waited for 45 minutes. And I said to the assistant, when are the band turning up? And he said, I don't think they are. And I thought, what? You know, I'd never, ever mixed an album, a track, where someone from the band wasn't there to say, yeah, like that, no, don't like that. And I thought, how the, you know, am I going to mix this? And I, I walked up, the studio was in the basement, so I walked upstairs and walked into the street and I walked around for a few minutes and I got really angry and I thought, for fuck's sake, they're just taking the piss. This is ridiculous. How am I meant to do a mix that they like if they're not here to, to comment? So I went down... And in all honesty, I made the most aggressive mix I could. I put the bass back into mono. I got Andy's guitars and I made them really loud and distorted. And I just made it sound like a punk track. You know, ah. snare drum that cut your ears off. Um, you know, the whole kit was really banging and, you know, sounded like it was in a toilet i mean just really really aggressive sound and i just thought well sub that i'll never hear from them again and i just left really depressed and i thought well that was a waste of time and uh the story is that over the following week every member of the band as i remember rang me up and said We've never heard our material sound so exciting. Wow. Uh, you know, and we'd like you to do a single with us. That's cool. Okay, so the single is, is it something I should know? Yeah. And so <laughs> the beginning of that, did they come in with a song written or did they, did they write no, the story? No, that was, that was really the biggest shock to me I, I you know the first thing I said when we convened at the studio was well you know where can I hear the demo of the song and they said well we haven't written it <laughs> <laughs> that's right okay <laughs> okay well then um right well uh what are we gonna do and they said well you know we got we'll, we'll just jam and we've got some ideas and you put them down on tape and we'll figure something out. That's what they did. And, and as you know, the track is based around Andy's guitar riff, which is very Beatlesque. Um, and that was the start of it. And Roger played a, a, a simple but effective drum beat with well positioned fills. Uh, I didn't really have to do much at all. I mean, you know, the odd suggestion here and there and um, helped Nick find sounds that would work and, and, and where they should go, that, that sort of low uh, sound that comes at the end of every bar was, was an idea I of mine. Um, gave some weight to the end of the line. Um, you know what I'm talking about, right? And um, then the sort of very, very well, I don't like it, but the sort of brass sound that he used in the chorus, we spent ages trying to find a, an effective brass sound, but in the end used that, and I wasn't happy with it. I don't think Nick was, but there you go, we used it. Um John played a good bass line. He made it as funky as possible, um, which wasn't that easy. And the track was put together. Now, all the time, Simon was sitting around writing lyrics. He, he, he would write lyrics, you know, to their meanderings and jamming. Um, on the spot, so to speak, and at the end of it, he had most of the lyrics written, some of which we, we all agreed were wrong and changed, most of which were okay. And he went out and he started to put down lead 
vocals and uh, he wasn't so bad. I mean, his tuning wasn't brilliant, but, you know, a bit of practice and a bit of dropping in, we we got a decent lead track and then he started to put harmonies. I really like those low groans that he puts in. I can't remember exactly where they are as I, I, I talk now, but if I heard the song, I'd know he... He puts these sort of low hmm sounds in somewhere, and they work really well. Um, he does up certain lines or words in the verses and builds the choruses, and, and it's all good. And uh, the song was finished, and then I said, I felt that the start of the song was too generic, that it sounded like, everybody else's song, you know, it just started with Andy's guitar and in and out and out and out and out. And I said, we need something distinctive so that the second time someone hears it, they know it's the Duran Duran single. And I said, let's try the start of Leader of the Pack, which is the drums you know, boom, ba boom, ka, boom, ba boom, ka. And so Roger started playing it, and Simon immediately started singing, please, please tell me now. And that was the intro, and I just thought, yep, yeah, that's right, that's good. You know, that's so distinctive, it's so different from the rest of the track, and Andy's guitar fitted in so well when those drums ended, you know, the last bang of the drums and then it just fitted perfectly and so I felt okay, we've done it, you know, that's a great sounding single um, and then the problem started uh, I couldn't mix it I just could not mix it. We tried to do it in Good Earth where we recorded it and it was terrible. Um, then I think we went to Gallery because I knew Gallery and I thought, well, I know the sound there. Couldn't mix it. We went to Roger Townsend, is it, from The Who? Yeah, and he had a studio on Eel Pie Island and we went there. And the mix was terrible. And in the end, I said, well, look, let's go to New York and use Bob Clearmountain, who mixed Roxy music and was considered at the time to probably be the best mixing engineer and sound guy in the world. And so we went to New York, and uh, I was suffering terribly from jet lag and kept falling asleep, but but what I did hear was him. He had a he had a whole rack of Pultec valve equalizers, one across every channel of a twenty four track. I mean, you can you believe that? And um, you know, he had the bait, the the kick, the sorry, the drum set bolted to the floor and all the mics in the same positions all the time, so he got a brilliant drum sound, um, you know, to add to what was there. And he mixed it, and we got back to London, and we listened to it, and we thought, well, it's brilliant, but it's not Duran Duran. It, it just wasn't Duran Duran. It was some sort of, I don't know, Brian Adams sort of thing. It was just mixed as a as a rock song simple as that and then someone and I don't know who it was suggested Alex Sadkin and so we went to Rack in St John's Wood and Alex listened to the tape and he said you know what he said whoever recorded the drums didn't know what they were doing and I suddenly realised that I had trusted the assistant engineer to record them and he had done a terrible job and they they came and went and the levels weren't consistent and it was just 
that was what was causing all the problems is you'd mix the track at the beginning in the drums being at a certain level and then you'd get to the first chorus and they'd be too low. So you'd pump them up and then you'd get to the next verse and they'd be too loud. So you'd drop them down again. And that was what the problem was, is you couldn't keep the drums at a certain level to make the track work. And he was the first one to identify that that's what the problem was. And so um, DMSs, do you know what a DMS is? No, I don't know what that is. It's a, it's a digital delay, and it was the first of its kind that came out. It would store um, a few seconds of sound that you could capture and then hit a button and it would replay it. Now, the <laughs> it shows you how things have changed. The memory, if you wanted to change that from like two seconds to 10 seconds, you'd pay about 250 pounds to get the RAM or whatever it was to, to increase the, the memory. It was absurd. But that's how much stuff cost in those days. Um, so basically what we did was he compressed every live drum sound on the tape down to like a click and then he he, he rented a stack of these DMS machines and he put his favourite kick drum, snare drum, hi-hat, toms, the lot in each of these machines and then fed the real drum sound which as I say had been reduced to a click into the DMS so it triggered the sound that was in it and all of a sudden we had a, a kick-ass drum sound that stayed the same level through the track and uh, from then on it was a relatively easy task for him to mis mix it and make it sound amazing and uh, to my relief and the band's you know acceptance we had a finished song i mean i i was so petrified that you know this i was so out of my depth i didn't know what to do and alex was such a nice guy that he never kind of kicked me around i mean he could so easily have said you're fucking useless i mean what the you know you shouldn't be doing this sort of stuff. You're not ready for it and all the rest of it. But he didn't. And i tell you a story in a minute. But basically, that that was done. Sent off to EMI. They were really happy with it. And they put it out. And it went straight in at number one. It didn't stay at number one. But it went in at number one. And then something else took its place about two weeks later. But... He had done the job. I mean, the idea of the single was to fill the gap between the second album, Rio, and the third album. It was going to be too long a gap. And EMI and everybody else was worried that they would slip out of the radar of everybody's consciousness. And so they felt, OK, well, we'll do a single in the spring and that'll keep them in people's consciousness so the the album third album will still have a good audience waiting to hear it so that's what it did and then the next thing i knew was i got a phone call from i think first of all from one of the barrow brothers saying that um we've had a talk with emi and we decided we're going to use alex for the album and that we don't need you anymore and that, I mean, it's not just that I lost the gig. It's that's the end of my career. I mean, everybody's going to know that I didn't cut it, that, that you know, I, I got this chance to work with the biggest band in the country and I messed it up. And that would, I never would have got another gig again. I would have just been finished. Please, please tell me now. 
Okay, that was part one of my interview with Ian Little. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm working on editing part two, so hopefully it won't be too long until I get that one out too. Now, I want to take a minute to tell you about, I think, a plan I have for the show going forward. As my regular listeners know, pretty much as soon as my third child was born, my episode output has been dramatically dropped, and then I went and moved across the country, and my whole kind of life has changed in that sense. So I'm not doing the weekly episodes. And now they're really sporadic. Every few months, I'll put one out. So what I've decided to do moving forward is to do the show in seasons, 10 episode seasons. So what I'm going to do is go on a binge and record 10 episodes and get them all cut and then release them, you know, one a week for 10 weeks. And that may be it for the year. Or maybe I'll do two seasons a year. I don't know. I know it's going to be some time until I can get back into the weekly episodes. So if I kind of give you a date, okay, October 1st, new season coming up and I'll be ready for it. And I know that I can commit, say there's going to be 10 episodes in a row, 10 weeks in a row, and then you can kind of rely on it. And then I'll kind of be quiet again, start doing some more interviews. Then I'll announce a date for my next season and start releasing episodes again. And that way you can kind of start depending on when they're going to happen and it won't be randomly a new episode pops up out of the blue, as it's been doing for the last couple of years, frankly. So that's the plan. I am still committed to doing the show, especially ones like this with Ian Little, which I was really excited about. But... I think Seasons is what I'm going to do moving forward, so I'm going to start doing my recording, and I'll announce soon when the season's going to start. So, that's it for this time. I can't say this week, but I can say this time, and look for part two of my interview with Ian Little very soon. 